Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Golden Sabrero Show. It's on a Friday. It's a little bit different. It's always on blazeradioonline.com every Monday night. But if you're joining us live on YouTube this Friday or just watching us on YouTube anytime, thank you. Welcome in. Dominic Stern, Cole Bradley, Ryan Blank here to talk about the latest news in baseball. Ryan, Cole, how are you guys doing? Doing all right, man. How about you? I'm doing good. The semester is winding down. A week from now, I'll be on the road heading back to California. Now, that's sad. It is what sad. A, what, but what, a start, what a way to start the show. Just tell, just tell us you're leaving, man. No, it's summer, dude. Summer break. It's okay. I, I leave a week from Monday. So Good news. Exactly. And you know what else is good news? I have some more golden sombreros to talk about because mm -hmm. – it was hey, actually do a very. A do we have, don't we have we, a platinum too? We do have a platinum. I was watching this live, so I uh, I tweeted about it because the Padres were getting smacked, and I said, "Oh hey, platinum Sabro, might as well." But uh, we only had a couple this week. Uh, first one was Randall Grichik of the Blue Jays on the 18th. Uh, Javi Baez against the Cubs, and then the following game, he hit a moonshot home run. But uh, that was his first Golden Sabro of the year. Knowing the way that he plays, he's going to have a lot more. Eugenio Suarez, he became the first player to get his second Golden Sombrero of the year on the 21st. Uh, Avisael Garcia was the guy who got the Platinum Sombrero. Struck out all five times against the Padres on the 21st as well. Paven Smith of the Diamondbacks got a Golden Sombrero as well. And that's it for this week. It was actually a very quick week in terms of Golden Sombreros because we had – I think almost 10 last week, but uh, this past week we only had five. So a uh, little disappointing, but, you know, the pitchers, they'll, they'll have their week this week. I can feel it. Uh, and uh, they've, they've been off to a very good start statistically throughout this season. And we want to start by talking about some of our teams. And Cole, your Diamondbacks, they won four straight, and they're playing a lot better ball right now. Talk about what's been going on this past week. Yeah, they've been virtually owning the Cincinnati Reds. They're five and one on the season against them, um, which is great. As much as the bullpen um, does their darndest to to lose the game, um, the offense, especially the last two days, looked really, really good um, in their ability just to take advantage, even if they weren't getting hits. The game they won in extras two nights ago, they were down three nothing in the ninth inning. They had, I think, one or two hits going into that inning. And they walked twice, and Josh Van Meter had his first home run against a lefty, and Amir Garrett for that matter. Um, and he tied the game, and they ended up winning it because they scored five runs in, like, the 11th. And that's just – they just found a way to win, which is which is cool to see from them because that's, that's definitely something that they've struggled to do in the past, and – Anytime that they can steal a win like that, that's always that's always fun. Yesterday was sort of the same story. They, I mean, it was just a slugfest. Um, like I said, the bullpen tried to do their best to sabotage it because Cincinnati hit six home runs yesterday, but um, it was all for naught. So that's yeah, they've been playing really good baseball. Um, they're five and two on their current road trip right now, and they start a series against Atlanta today, which is that'll be tough, but. They're doing this all with Cattell, all without Cattell Marte, which is nice to see because that offense, especially in the past two years, has been so – ever since Paul Goldschmidt left, that offense has always been so inconsistent every single night. You'll either get double digits one night or they'll get shut out and they'll only get like one hit the next. And so that's, the, that's always been the problem is this offense just doesn't look very competent one night and then the next night it's like, okay, this is a whole different team. But – They've definitely, especially lately, looked a lot better, a lot better at bats. Carson Kelly has looked really, really good. Um, he had a home run yesterday, I think. Uh, you know, David Peralta had a five-hit night yesterday. So, you know, all these guys are – they're hitting well, and they're doing it without arguably their best offensive player. So um, that's encouraging to see. And then the starting pitching looks like it's sort of settling in. Um, so that's, that's good as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm shocked to be completely honest. Um, I don't think I would have 
I would have thought in my wildest dreams we'd be here right now. It's still very early, of course, and they're still in fourth place when you stack it up. But uh, fourth fourth place looks a lot better when you know you have nine wins and the third place team only has two more. So that's always nice to see. And of course, the Dodgers already have what is it like a five game lead on on uh, Arizona as well. So it's you know it's it's just about you know doing what they can while they. Um, while they can, I suppose. Madison Bumgarner looked really good in his last start as well against the Nationals, and that's gonna that's a huge thing because he needs to definitely take strides in the in the right direction. Um, I think he's got one more start on the road trip, but that was also very encouraging. So there's a lot of really good signs so far. So I'm as a fan pretty happy about that. And uh, I found a stat that was tweeted by the Reds athletic writer. I don't know his name, but it says uh, it's C. Trent Rosecrans. So Trent Rosecrans of The Athletic tweeted this about the series against the Diamondbacks. Red starters put up a 1.15 this series, and the offense had a 257, 341, and 486 slug line or slash line with seven home runs, and the team scored 20 runs in three games. And the Diamondbacks swept the Reds. So Diamondbacks showed a lot of fight in that series against the bullpen. And the Reds defense also made a couple of costly errors. But hey, Diamondbacks did what they had to do to get the wins. And that is all that matters from the Diamondbacks standpoint. But uh, after the Reds came into in the Phoenix and kind of put it to the Diamondbacks earlier this year, the Diamondbacks went to Cincinnati and Great American Small Park and got the job done. But Ryan, your Royals, they're still in first place at 10-7. They have a negative six run differential, which means that is absolutely not going to hold up, but uh, at least the way that they're playing right now. But, hey, they're in first place. How, how have they looked this past week? The only reason they have a negative six run differential is because they lost 14-7 to seven in their race the other day. That's really the only reason. But since we talked last four, so have gone four and two. They won the last three games against the Blue. No. They won two out of the last three against the Blue Jays, which – I'm good with. They won three out of four in that series. And they came into this week without losing a series. One of two teams in the majors to not lose a series yet. And then they lose the first two of the Rays and lose the series. The starting pitching is starting to worry me even more. Brad Keller looked awful. Danny Duffy got screwed over with some horrible defense, which is not the Royals. The Royals are known for being one of the most defensively sound teams in baseball year in and year out. And Witt looked horrible on defense. Santana made one of the worst errors I've ever seen at first base on a pop-up. The defense screwed over some pitching, but I think it's all worth it when they avoided the sweep the other night on Wednesday with the walk-off from Salvi, who had an incredible homestand. I had two walk-offs, including a walk-off homer, and I depressed my roommate that night. If you guys know – if you guys know – the 2014 wild card game. My roommate's an A's fan. So the Salvador Perez walk off it down the third baseline brought some amazing memories for me, but some haunting memories for him. So that that was fun to mess with him for a little bit. But no, I'm happy with how the Warriors are looking. The offense continues to produce and do what they have to do, but the pitching is still worrisome. I don't know what to say other than that besides the pitching has to figure it out. Otherwise, it is. Otherwise, this is not going to last anywhere close to where they want it to last. So, right now, the main focus has to be the starting rotation and the bullpen because the offense is going to continue to put up runs. The offense has been extremely legit this year, but like you and I both agree, we'll see how long they'll, they'll float above 500. But for now, they got a game and a half lead over the White Sox for first place. And, uh, I'm sure you've had a ton of fun watching that. And uh, for my Padres, you know, they had a very rough homestand after the Friday night game. They ended up finishing the homestand 1-5 and five after getting swept by the Milwaukee Brewers. But when you look at it, they faced Brandon Woodruff, Corbin Burns, and then Adrian Hauser, and they scored a combined three runs off those guys, and they scored zero runs off the Brewers' bullpen the entire series. It was just a rough series. Uh, some of the guys were clearly fighting through their injuries, but that's no excuse uh, because the Brewers walked into Petco Park without Lorenzo Kane, Christian Yelich, and Colton Wong and swept 
the Padres. So you got to give credit to the Brewers. Uh, they're currently in first place in the NL Central. And l- let's start there. L- let's talk about the NL Central because we we talked about the NL East last week, but we didn't get to the NL Central and the NL West. We kind of already touched on the NL West with Cole and I talking about the, our teams, the Arizona Diamondbacks and the San Diego Padres. But the only team above 500 in the Central is the Brewers. The Reds have come back down to earth after their hot start. Of course, losing four straight. Um, but Cubs and Reds at 99. And then the Pirates and the Cardinals each have 10 loss, each have 10 losses. Uh, what have we made of this division so far? I mean, it's just it's just craziness. And I don't think it's as crazy. I think I'm sure we'll get to the East soon, but I don't think it's as crazy as the East. But I will say, I mean, this is just sort of or early season. Um, this is pretty characteristic, I feel like, of the early season for most of these clubs. I mean, I don't really, I'm not, I don't think too much of it, to be com- completely honest. The the Pirates have nine wins. Like that's just like what? Like that's not going to last at all. We all know that. Um, and the one thing I will say is that you know, even though the Brewers are eleven and seven, they are in first. They're being carried right now by their pitching, and that's sort of been the same exact thing that I talked about. Um, last week and in the past weeks, I know. Um, and that's only going to go so far because their pitching can only do so much. The later and later you get into the season, the more teams have seen the same guy, especially when you're playing in your division. Um, and the more, the easier it becomes to, you know, hit those guys and, you know, be able to adapt against them. Now, that's not always the case, but, um, you know, history sort of uh, has made it that way and it's sort of been going in that direction you know the more you face a guy the better you are against him um so i could totally see that happening for a lot of the inner division teams that um face off against the brewers and again if they don't start scoring runs at a higher rate they're not going to continue to be in first place that's just how that works you can't win if you can't score um yeah i don't really think too much of it to be completely honest i, I mean it's just sort of a crazy start i did watch a little bit of the pirates tigers game last night and I will say that even though it is still very early in the year I actually think that these two teams have been very entertaining and I would argue that you know they're they're up there as far as some of the the more worst teams in baseball um I'm sure I'm sure anyone can agree with with me on that but at least early in the year these teams have definitely been competing and good for them because you know once we get to um August and September they're going to be absolutely um they're going to be horrible. <laughs> that's just how it. That's just how it goes. Um, but at least early in the year, it's 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 sort of refreshing to see some new teams, um, or some teams that you didn't expect to perform well, perform well. And that's again, that's always that's always just kind of f- fun to see. So um, I've enjoyed that. But yeah, like you said, Cincinnati's come back down to earth. I mean, Chicago's. Chicago's playing true to their record because it feels like just one game, everything just falls apart for them. And then the next they score like, you know, double digit runs. I think it was a couple nights ago they put up, it was like 14 against the the Mets that's, Braves. Yeah, mm-hmm. against the Mets. Like, you know, that's obviously not going to happen every night. And, you know, their offense is, just, is as inconsistent as it gets. But, um, yeah, again, I don't really think too much of it. We'll see what happens. But um, this division is going to kind of be a little bit of a uh, of a competition. For, I feel like there's three clear-cut favorites, and that's the Cardinals, the Brewers, and potentially the Reds if they can if they can figure their stuff out. Um, I will say for the Reds, I thought the pitching was going to get worse, but Tyler Maley has, and I might talk about him a little later. Tyler Maley is very, very good. He definitely has taken a step in the right direction. Uh, he looked really good against the Diamondbacks. I think that bullpen just sort of needs to figure their stuff out, and their bullpen's already very, very good if you look at it. Um, on paper, it's just, and the offense is obviously going to score runs, but yeah, this division's crazy. That's all you can really say. Ryan, what do you think about the NL Central? It, I don't really think much of it yet because most teams are only like 20 games in at most. And if I'm the Cardinals, I'm disappointed in how the Cardinals have looked. They their offense is struggling. Their pitching hasn't really looked good. As someone who does not like the Cardinals whatsoever, I'm happy with it, but I would be disappointed in how they're playing because they're just not looking good. The Pirates have actually looked pretty entertaining. I'm actually excited for the Royals to play a two game series with them 
in the coming week. I'm, I think they've looked entertained. They've actually surprised some people. Being able to win nine of their first 20 games, I would not have expected that or really thought that they would have done that. The Brewers, they may be in first, like Cole said, but I agree. They're being carried by their pitching. Their offense isn't there. They need to really get something going with the bats and something that's sustainable. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to keep the lead. They have to be able to score runs at a higher rate than what they're doing right now. The Cubs, it just makes sense. The Cubs are hot or cold. That's how it is every single game. And that's why they're 500 at 9-9. and And then the Reds have started to slip. They start out red hot, and now they're starting to slip a little bit, and it's probably because the Diamondbacks own them this year. But overall, this division, it, I don't have many worries about it right now. It, we're still early, early into the season. But if I'm a Cardinals fan, I'm just disappointed with the slow start. Yeah, and you look at their lineup. Their lineup actually hasn't been that bad. It's just guys haven't been able to get the key hits whenever they need them, and they aren't being able to drive in runs because, like you mentioned, their offense as a whole has been disappointing. But, like, you look at them statistically and you look at their players statistically, it actually hasn't been that bad. But the pitching staff currently at a 4.67 ERA, I think – we all expected that to be much better. You know, the Cardinals, they always have very consistent and reliable pitching staff. In Flaherty, he's having a great year. 21 innings, 21 strikeouts. Uh, only got a 3.8 ERA. And uh, I'd imagine that's going to continue to go down because we all know the caliber of pitcher that Flaherty is. And then you look at the rest of the starting rotation, and it's okay. Um, but the bullpen is kind of where the majority of the disappointment has been. Uh, Daniel Ponce de Leon, who's been a, uh, a swing man, uh, started a couple of games. He's also pitched some out of the bullpen. Uh, nine innings, 10 runs. That's not ideal for them. Tyler Webb, one of the better left-handed pitchers. He's got six innings, six earned runs. So once again, not ideal. Ryan Helsley, hard-throwing right-hander, 10 innings, six earned, six earned runs. Andrew Miller, six innings, five earned runs. So some of their guys – aren't contributing the way that they need to be. And when you look at it and when you look at their run differential, uh, they only have a minus two run differential. So they're playing a lot of close games. And when your bullpen isn't doing that good in close games, all of a sudden you're going to be losing those close games, which of course is the situation the Cardinals find themselves in. I, I still have a ton of faith in them. And I mean, yeah, the Brewers, Cole, you were talking about it. This pitching staff is unreal. And I mean, we all knew that was the strength of this team. Like that, no, no fool didn't know that. But Woodruff has been really good to start the year. Corbin Burns is unreal. He set the he set the major league record for strikeouts to start a season as a starter without allowing a walk. And I he, I believe he's up to forty. I'll pull it up. But uh, he he passed Adam Wainwright, and I mean it it was just unreal to watch the way that his cutter moved and the way that Potters, the Potters hitters had to respect it on the outside edge. They, they were swinging at straight fastballs that were like four inches off the plate because they thought it would be a cutter and it would come right back on the outside edge. And I'm like, my gosh, that this dude is just living. He's just so far deep in uh, in Potters hitters heads. Yeah, he's, at, he's up to 40 strikeouts. He's only allowed one run and four starts, which was a home run off the bat of Byron Buxton. And uh, that was the only run he allowed in his first start, and they ended up getting the loss in that game, which, I mean, I think says a lot about the, the Brewers. Uh, they don't score runs, but uh, they got a couple of key bats who are, are contributing very nicely. Billy McKinney, uh, he has a couple of home runs on the year. Uh, he's made some really good plays for them out in left field, which, of course, frustrated the heck out of me. Uh, and then you look at Jace Peterson and Luis Arias, Two former Padres, of course, they're they're having decent years offensively. Um, and then Omar Novaez, their, their catcher. So in 2019 and prior, very, you know, hitter guy. He's kind of like Gary Sanchez, but a left-hand hitting catcher. You know, hit the ball really well, played okay defense, but he hit. And that's why he served his value. And then it's funny because the, the roles kind of switched in 2020. 
he like became more of like you know like a backstop, like a guy that became a really good pitch caller and a guy that was playing really good defense for them. And while their pitching staff was really good, but the bat kind of disappeared from him last year. And then this year, he just put it all together and like had to be completely honest. Like, who am I voting for? I'm gonna vote for him over JT Ryumuto for the All Star game right now. Now, of course, this is why you don't vote right right when All Star voting uh, gets released because uh, there's three there's three months before All Star game voting should be should be fully counted as opposed to just you know, doing it as soon as it gets to May, because I can tell you right now, Omar Navais is not going to have a 188 OPS plus when we get to June and July. That's just not going to happen. But dude, dude's killing the ball right now. And he had a couple of big extra base hits and a couple of uh, timely singles that uh, that's propelling the struggling Brewers offense. And he said they walked into Petco Park and swept a very good pitching staff. So... A lot of props to the Brewers. I I don't think their 11 and 7 start the way they're pitching right now is sustainable. But I mean, this team we all knew was going to be a very good team coming in. And I think they could definitely, you know, sneak in as possibly the second wildcard team in the in baseball right now, especially the way the NL East has panned out so far, which we'll we'll get to. But uh, the Brewers, I, I've liked I've liked what I've seen so far. Uh, Let's move to the East because uh, we, we already kind of touched on the West. But in the East, every team is at or below 500. You got the Mets and the Phillies at 500 to start. Mets at 7-7 seven and because, seven of course, it's very, been very well documented. They're very, very weird start. The Phillies at 9-9. Nine and, nine, and then you got the Braves and the Marlins at 8-10. and 10, And the Nationals at 7-9. and nine. So, guys, I'm going to you know change this up a bit. What has been the biggest surprise to you guys in this division? Uh, for me, at least, that's that's tough. Um, I'd say the I'm gonna be honest. I'd say the I'd say the Braves. Um, the Braves the Braves are shocking to me in the sense that um, I really thought they had a chance to sort of have like a like a Dodger kind of start where they just rattle off like like a bazillion wins and they they draw like this huge gap to start the year. That has not been the case at all. And even though the bullpen was the weakness going in, I didn't think that the bullpen was going to be like, and I'm not going to say it's abysmal, but I didn't think it was going to be this bad. Um, and again, it's not the strength of their team. In fact, it's probably one of, if not their lone weakness. Um, but that, that bullpen has just not been good for them. Um, and the starting has been has been okay. That offense is going to score so many runs. It's it's not even funny because they got obviously all star after all star. It feels like in that lineup. But um, yeah, I they've they've shocked me because I don't feel like they've played like a relatively hard schedule yet to have the record that they have. Like I would have expected the Marlins series to go their way a little bit more. I would have expected the Cubs series to go more of their way, um, and I just don't think that was the case. And that's that's going to be a problem if they keep doing that down the stretch. I don't think that will happen, but they've had to play a lot of close games. And you know, you mentioned um, you mentioned like with the Cardinals earlier, you know they've dropped a lot of those close games because their bullpen hasn't kept them in it. It's sort of been the same thing here. Um, Atlanta has played a lot of close games um, and they just haven't gone their way because the bullpen just can't figure out a way to um, work their way out of trouble. And that's going to be an issue if you keep doing that. And I could easily see this team shopping relievers well before the deadline if it continues to be an issue because they need to figure it out like right away. Um, and if they don't, they could easily implode and this could be turned on its ear. And then, you know, we could be looking at a team that we thought was going to be in the first place in the division and falls way the heck off um, come July. And then it's like a it's it's a gap that's almost impossible to to cover. But we'll see what happens. I don't I still have faith in them. I don't doubt them. But as in terms of who surprised me the most, it's them. And it's not in a good way. For me, it's between the two teams that were supposed to be at the top this year. The Braves, that bullpen has been bad. And, yeah, they don't have Acuna right now, but he's really been the only guy hitting. 
You haven't seen a ton from Freddie Freeman or Albies or Zuna really so far. And I think that's got to be frustrating if you're a Braves fan because you just locked up Ozuna. And then knowing that your top hitter and arguably the hottest hitter in baseball right now is hurt, it's not a good recipe for success right now. And then the bullpen's looking bad. They lost Melanson. They lost Shane Green. And it's showing. That bullpen, I, I expect it to not be as good as it was last year because they lost some big pieces. But I'm not expected to struggle like this, and it's really struggled so far. They've got to figure that part out. But overall, they've been disappointing, but they've started to rally some wins. They're looking a little bit better. Then for the Mets, I have no idea what to say. I I feel for Jacob DeGrom. They don't win when he throws. The guy will go out there, pitch seven scoreless, and still get a loss. Well, seven, seven innings and – give up a run or two, and then they'll still lose. They got Francisco Lindor to fix the hitting, to help the lineup. And the lineup's not producing at all. Pete Alonso's not really doing much. It's pathetic. If I'm Jacob DeGrom, I'd, I'm surprised he's still in New York. I'm surprised he hasn't requested a trade. Because they don't win when he's pitching. They give him zero run support. It's like the offense feels they can take the day off. Or the bullpen will blow it. It's I don't know how Mets fans can deal with this, but the Mets have been extremely disappointing, and it would not shock me if they just continue to slip. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of been between the Mets and the Braves who have been the most shocking. But honestly, to me, the most shocking thing is that the Marlins are the only team in this division with a positive run differential. I expected this team to uh, be at the wrong end of a lot of the beatdown in this division, and that last year was a big fluke, and a big part of the reason they won was because they won a lot of close games last year, and their bullpen, which was a key part of, of course, winning a lot of close games, lost Brandon Kinsler. They also lost Nick Vincent, and they also lost another really good relief pitcher last year, forgetting it. But – uh I was thinking, man, this team is going to have a huge letdown here. And they've proven me wrong so far. Keyword is so far. And like what both of you guys have had on the head, we're still only 20 games uh, around. Cause some teams are at 19. Some teams are at 21. It all depends on the team. We're, we're right around 20 games in uh, for the year. And you can't put too much stock into it because there's still 140 games left, which is just so awesome to say feels good after we had the 60 game season last year that it, it's a real baseball season this year and that I, I, I'm excited to see where this division unfolds because you got to remember one of these teams is making the playoffs and uh, for all the fans that are panicking, uh, I'm sure the Mets fans are panicking right now as they've lost three uh, and they have not looked good. The Phillies after the hot start have come a little bit back down to earth. And the Braves were expected to, you know, compete with the Dodgers for to be one of the best teams in baseball this year. They have him in that. And the Nationals offense has been a dumpster fire so far. And they've had some COVID issues, so they haven't really been at full strength yet. And they're getting there, and they've played a lot better since they've gone at full strength. But they, uh, they've they certainly been disappointing to start. So that division will certainly get a lot better as time goes on. Uh, let's talk about the AL West. Uh, to start the American League. You got two horses in front um, in the West, and it's not the two teams we would have expected and not the two teams we were talking about last week, but it's the Mariners and the A's at the top, and the A's have won 11 straight games after starting 0-6 to the season. That is an absolutely incredible turnaround, but the Mariners are right there with them at 12-7. and Guys, what have we made of these two teams' performances so far? I should have stuck with the A's when I picked them to win a division, dude. Um, yeah, this is this is ridiculous. This is like – this is crazy. They they snapped, and, I mean, I, I haven't really been watching them much, which I'm going to definitely start from here on out. But the the thing with them that's crazy is that they're, they're pretty injury-riddled, and guys like Seth Brown have stepped up big time for them. Um, Matt Olsen has had a good week. Um They've stepped up, so the A's definitely look a lot better. And Jesus Lazardo had a good start the other night. Um, 
yeah, I, this team's this team finds a way to win. That's their best quality, and that's how they've always done it. It feels like for at least as long as I've been alive, um, they just find a way to win, and they they just don't go down without a fight. That lat that um that game they played against the Twins the other night was insane. Um, went into extra innings, and you know they just fought back. That's that just that that's that shows the character that this team has, and um, I don't know. I just think they're built well, and that's 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 good on them for you know saying, hey, we don't want to lose again, <laughs> so let's just let's just continue to find a way to win. Because obviously, I I I thought that their start was a little bit of of a fluke because again, this team just always finds a way to win. You can't say that enough. And as far as the Mariners are concerned. I mean, and I'm I'm gonna talk about him a little later, but I mean, yeah, this team has been insane, and I think one guy, at least to me, really stands out. Um, again, I'll talk about him later, but they've been they've been really good, and the pitching has been good as well. Justin Dunn turned in a really good start. I think it was last night against the Red Sox, um, and yeah, this team's gonna be gonna continue to be extremely good. Uh, I feel like if they can stay healthy. And if these young guys can continue to perform, they can at least compete with sort of the middle and lower tier teams in that division and sort of maybe play spoiler come end of the season. Because right now, even though even though they don't look the best, they're finding a way to win again. And that's such a huge thing about those two teams in this division is they're finding ways to win. Um, and that's always kind of fun to see at the beginning of the year. And Kyle Lewis, I'm pretty sure they just recently got him back. So that'll definitely help their odds as well. Um, but yeah, this, this is a pretty interesting start to say the least. Um, I think the angels are figure will figure it out at some point. They need to get a few guys back healthy. Um, the Astros have been abysmal, like really bad. Um, they've fallen off big time. So, um, that's, that's, that's interesting because I think at least a few, at least a couple of us thought that they were still going to be competitive near the top of that division, and I still think they will. Um, but again, they they haven't really been playing good baseball, and I'm pretty sure they lost a series against the Rockies, which that's never a good look um, when you're going to drop the series against the worst team in baseball. Um, so, but yeah, who knows? Um, it's it's sort of an interesting start. The West is a is a pretty weak division. We've already talked about that, but. Yeah, I mean, if the A's and the Mariners can somehow, some way, pull away some kind of in- incredible lead to begin the year here, that that that'd be entertaining, and that would be really fun to watch. Right. For me, one of the shockers has to be the Astros, even though they are riddled with injuries. I believe they they are without Alvarez, Bregman, and Altuve, which those are three key guys on your infield, and you need those guys. So. They're riddled with injuries. Same with the Angels. The Angels don't have their third baseman in Rendon. They need to get him back. They need that bat in the lineup. <sighs> Sorry, I thought I was about to sneeze. Um, the Rangers actually have started to maybe settle down a little bit. Nine and ten, so they're settling down a tiny bit. Not the greatest start, but a lot better than we all anticipated, really. And then the two teams at the top, the Athletics just know how to win. They always t- find a way – to put themselves in positions to win. And that's what they continue to do. That's why they've won 11 straight. Should they have won the other night in extras against the Twins? No, no way. Twins botched that game. But still, the A's are finding ways to win, and they're 12-7. and seven. We, we all expected them to finish in the upper half of that division. And they're proving that they can still win the division after losing two key pieces in Simeon and Liam Hendricks. So... I'm impressed with how the A's are looking right now. Is it sustainable, this win streak? No. But their ability to continuously win is definitely still sustainable, and it will help them throughout the season. Then for the Mariners, for such a young team, they're playing very well. The pitching's looking looking really well, really good, I should say. And it's really helping, especially after losing a guy like James Paxton, who is supposed to be that veteran guy throughout the season. He had Tommy John, so losing him, I thought was going to be a little bit of an issue, but it hasn't. And then young guys on the offense are really hitting as well. I also got to highlight Kyle Seager. He's hitting the ball really well. So 
The Mariners are actually looking really good. I don't think they'll be able to sustain this, but at the same time, I still think they'll be able to keep up for a little bit in this division. You know, and I think the Mariners start is kind of similar to the Royals uh, in a situation to where they're they're winning a ton of close games and then they're getting blown out in their losses, which is typically a sign of getting a little bit lucky in your wins. But uh, I actually think this Mariners start is not a fluke, uh, especially compared to years prior, because we we've always seen the Mariners at the top of this division, you know, like mid April. And everyone's talking about, is this real? I actually think this this Mariners team is like a good team and can certainly, you know, be fighting for a playoff spot late in October. And this isn't going to be a team that's just going to roll over and die in fourth place. Now, when it's all said and done, where do I think this team's going to end up in this division? I still think it's fourth place, but uh, they look a lot better. And like you mentioned, Cole, this pitching staff is actually like pretty solid. You look at it, uh, Marco Gonzalez hasn't been at his best. And the other guys are stepping up this rotation. Justice Sheffield, who they got in the Mariners trade for James Paxton uh, originally. And then, of course, James Paxton went back to them this offseason. Uh, he's been really good for them. Justin Dunn, who was the other guy in the uh, the infamous Edwin Diaz and Robinson Cano trade with the Mets, uh, which, of course, is a trade that's going to haunt the Mets for years. Uh, and uh, having a uh, an agent uh, be your general manager. Turns out that was not a good idea for the Mets. Um, but to me, the biggest shock of this division is that the Rangers are at 9-10. and 10. Uh, How? This team is so bad, and I I don't know how they're, they're afloat right now. But, hey, good for them. Um, enjoy it while it lasts, Rangers fans. I hope you've had a fun first 19 games at 9-10 and because the way this division looks right now, you will not stay right around 500 for a very long time. But uh, – Good for them. Uh, Ryan, I want to go to you first. Let's talk about the rest of the AL Central. Every team has a negative run differential, uh, except for the White Sox, but the only team above 500 is your Royals. Uh, why are the other teams below 500 and struggling right now? All right, first off, you got to look at the Tigers. The Tigers are just – they're a young team. They're a young team. They are they started out hot, and they swept the Astros – Going to like six and three at the time, I believe they've just fallen apart since then. And I'm excited because the Royals have a three game series against them, and I always want to beat up on the Tigers. But I think that for them, it's just the youth, and I think that when the situation that they're in, they're still rebuilding, still waiting for their young guys to come up. So you, if you're a Tigers fan, you just have to be patient with that team. The Twins, I think, have been the most disappointing team in baseball right now. Sitting at six and twelve, this team should not be in the cellar of the division whatsoever. They've got Barrios. They've got the offense to really light it up. Kepler, Sano, Cruz, Donaldson. They have the offense. Buxton's been their best hitter, and nobody would have thought that coming into the season that Buxton was going to be out hitting their top guys like Sano and and Cruz. Nobody thought that, and. They ha- and their bullpen has just looked bad, too. I expected the Twins to look a lot better than this, and they need to figure something out. Even though they're now dealing with COVID, they got to figure something out quick because it's not a good start for the Twins. They have to figure something out because this is a team that I that I think all of us, or at least two of us, I think, predicted to be in the wild card. And this team is not looking like they will come anywhere close to it if they continue to play like they are. But like I said, it's early. They're 18 games in. Going to the third place team, the Cleveland Indians, the pitching is what's doing their job. The offense is not there. They don't have that great of an offense. They only have Jose Ramirez, who hasn't been great so far. But like I said, this team, their offense was going to struggle this year. They lost their best offensive player in Lindor and – they didn't get anything to replace him, really. Eddie Rosario's not really hitting well. And I think that you had to expect a down offense, and they're pitching to carry him, and that's what they're and that's what's happened. Their pitching hasn't looked bad. They always have a top-tier pitching staff. Excuse me. Uh, White Sox. I don't know how I feel about the White Sox. It's just their offense is very hot and cold. 
They're also dealing with injuries of their own. They did get Tim Anderson back, which helps a lot. But the loss of Eloy Jimenez really is hitting them hard. But this is a team that's kind of like the Cubs, in my opinion, hot and cold every single night. You're not really seeing anything from them to where they can prove that they can go on a long winning streak. So, and I'm not saying that's not going to happen. They have the talent. They have the caliber of players to where they can do that, but they've got to figure it out. They've got – and they have Lance Lynn hurt, which doesn't help. Their, one of their top starters is hurt. So, they're, they have a couple injuries that are really hitting them, but they have really just have to figure it out. And the offense has been a little bit slower than I would have anticipated from the start. And then, the only two above 500, my Royals. You asked me if this was what it was going to be, I would have laughed in your face. Because – the Royals' offenses look great. On the homestand, the two top players on the homestand were Carlos Santana and Salvador Perez, who each hit three home runs in that homestand. But the pitching is still extremely suspect. Brad Keller said three out of his four starts be really bad, even though his last one got killed by some bad errors in the first inning. But he hasn't looked great so far. Denny Duffy and Jacob Junis have both looked great so far. It's just the defense really hurt them in their past outings against the Rays. So that's what hurt them. But I really like what the Royals have done. I think that if they can figure out the pitching to where it can be consistent and not be giving up four or five runs from every other starter, then they'll be in good shape. But I said at the beginning of the year, the kryptonite for this team is going to be the pitching. And so far, that's what it's proved to be. All right. Thank you for your your insider information. And uh, Cole, uh, we're not insiders on the AL Central, but we can still talk about it. Uh, I mean, what do you make this? This division's off to a really wacky start. Yeah, almost every single one is. And, I mean, yeah, like you guys said, I mean, I'm surprised a lot about the White Sox so far. I mean, they've had some good games and good performances, obviously. Um, one thing about them, and, I mean – Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I am, though. Lucas Giolito has struggled for them early in the season. I think he got touched up in his last start, um, and he hasn't looked the best. And like you said, Ryan, they're out without Lance Lynn, who was that big arm they went out and acquired, um, you know, obviously as well. And I think they're starting to feel the impacts of Eloy Jimenez not being in the lineup as well. Um, and which they're going to have to get used to that because he's not going to be with them until probably the postseason. Um, and that's if he, if they even make it, which I'm sure they will. Um, they have been kind of without Tim Anderson, as far as I know, for a good chunk of the season. They got him back now. Um, but, yeah, this team's, this team's interesting. Uh, I still think they're going to be really good, and I still think they're off to a bit of a um, fluky start. But we'll see how this shapes up for them. Um, again, I – I'm just going to be really looking at how Larusa impacts them, and so far it's actually—I mean—he's been pretty good for them. Um, but yeah, it's just been kind of interesting. So that's really my take on them. Um, and this team's this, this division is definitely not going to, um, I think, shock anyone at the end of the season, but it definitely could. And I think the Twins being in last place is definitely shocking in and of itself. Um, the Tigers being ahead of them. I think is a lot to do with AJ Hinch. Um, I think AJ Hinch is going to be a really, really good addition for them, regardless of what he did when he was in Houston. Say what you will about him. He's actually a really good manager. He's a really good game manager. He knows how to manage a pitching staff. Um, that's sort of that former catcher instinct, I feel like. Um, that's why former catchers make great managers. Um, but, you know, there's a, there, there's a lot of this division that you just shouldn't be too – tied up in yet i don't think because again things are gonna things are gonna settle down for the teams at the top i don't think the royals are gonna sustain a 10 and 7 start um that's just i mean that i just don't think that's the case they've played a lot of home games as well i think that's also another thing that's sort of helped them out um say what you will about home field advantage or not they've played a lot of home games and that definitely helps them um once they go on the road that's that's definitely going to change, and I think you'll see that right away. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't get really tied up into it. I think the Twins are going to figure something out at some point. 
Um, I think it's absolutely shocking that Byron Buxton, who prior to this season, I think everybody can agree he was a defense first outfielder. Um, I would even I, I don't I don't know that might be too far. I would even say he's more of a Billy. He was like more of a Billy Hamilton type where he strikes out or you know his only his only way on base is like via the walker, like the slap hit down the third baseline, and then he steals second base or something. He showed off a lot of power this season. I think that's that's big for them because with the lineup that's so full of power, um, to have those guys struggling, you need somebody to sort of pick up the slack. And if it's coming from anywhere, you'll take that. But I think it's pretty surprising when it's coming from the guy who, you know, prior to this season was never known for doing that. So um, that's – Definitely something to um, admire um, when it comes to that. But, yeah, I mean, I think they've been surprising. I think the Tigers, in a good way, have been surprising because I don't think they've been as bad as I thought they were going to be. Um, and, you know, it's only a matter of time before they call up their prospects and, you know, they start to actually really become something to pay attention to. Um, but Casey Myers has been pretty solid to start the year. Mm-hmm. That's a good sign because they're going to need him to really be good in the next few seasons. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things about this division. I just don't think it's sustainable for the Royals to stay in first place. But I wouldn't be surprised if they, they're hanging around second or third for most of the season. So um, definitely, definitely don't take their start with a grain of salt. Yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, Byron Buxton is finally turning into the player that, you know, the number one overall prospect and the number two overall pick uh, was expected to. And he actually broke out offensively last year. But, yeah, I mean, like you mentioned before that, dude sucked at the plate. Like, it was really bad. And now, I mean, he's he's an unreal, uh, off to an unreal start. And uh, all credit goes to him for turning that around. And then Lance Lynn, yeah, he was incredible. 19 and two-thirds innings, 27 strikeouts, and only two earned runs to start the year. That's on the injured list. And, yeah, Giolito, off to a rough start. 18 innings, 12 earned runs. So he's not been great, but, I mean, it, his FIP is 3.52 and his ERA is 5.79. So it'll even out more towards four in his next upcoming starts. If he pitches like how he has been is basically what the statistics mean. But, uh. With Lance Lynn on the injured list, you know who the, you know who, who hops in the rotation, boys. Michael Kopech. I love that dude. He is awesome. He's off to a fantastic start. Ten innings, two earned runs. Uh, the league will rue the day once he becomes a full time starter in that lethal rotation. And uh, the White Sox will be just fine. But yeah, the Twins they're they're in a weird spot. And they'll they'll be fine. I mean, they they threw away a couple of the games against the A's. And the A's have been getting lucky, but they're also hot. So, you know, when you're when it rains, it pours, and it's pouring right now in Minnesota, as it typically does. So I think the Twins will be, you know, perfectly fine. Uh, negative three run differential and six and 11 is an anomaly. That is nuts. Uh, they'll, they'll be fine. I have faith in that. So let's skip the AL East because nothing's really changed in the past uh, week. And let's talk about some key players that, uh, that we've noticed. Uh, I want to start with you, Ryan. Uh, I want you to give a shout out to a hitter and a pitcher who have just been killing it so far. When I look at hitter, the past week or so, I gotta give it to Bryce Harper. He's 11 for 17. He has a pair of home runs, four RBIs. His OPS this past week is 1.845. I don't know what else you would want to see from a hitter, but he's looked really good so far throughout the season. Thinking about a pitcher, it's tough. Um, I'd have to think about it. I have a couple more hitters in my head. Just no pitchers have really stood out to me a ton so far this this week. But I will give a shout out to I'll give a shout out to Ryan Weathers after what he did last night. He looked really good last night. He didn't go deep into the game, but he looked really good and shut down a, a very good Dodgers lineup. So I'll give Weathers a shout out for you, Dom. That's what I'll do. Yeah, it's scary to think that Ryan Weathers was the third best pitching prospect in the Potters organization during this year, and he has thrown nine and two thirds scoreless innings against the Los Angeles Dodgers. I mean, if that if that doesn't shake 
you as like, holy moly, this this farm system is still really good. I mean, that he's been astounding so far. And uh, it's funny because after the 2019 minor league season, everyone's like, you know, did we like miss on this pick? Uh, he kind of struggled and like, he's kind of like overweight, but I mean, he's slimmed down and he's just been so good. It's been awesome to watch. Oh, All I, have right, cool. guy. I have one more guy. All right. Aaron Nola. Complete All game. Right. Aaron Nola. I, I was thinking, I was like, I'm pretty sure Nola had a complete game shutout. Then I just checked to make sure. Yeah, Aaron Nola has been incredible to start this season. So give me Aaron Nola for that one. All right, Cole, give me a pitcher and a hitter to uh, that, uh, that you want to shout out. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with pitcher. I already mentioned Tyler Malley, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in depth. Um, go. I watched a video at the beginning of the season about um from foolish baseball who i'm sure you guys know great great youtube channel good good content on there um and he highlighted a few players who he thought were going to break out this year and one of which was tyler malley and i was like who the hell is that guy um i i've never really heard about him to this point um and i i'm looking at it now and he made a start a couple nights ago against the diamondbacks and this guy is really, really solid. He's nasty, and he's he's definitely got a control of the strike zone as well. I think at one point he had thrown like 40 pitches, and 31 were strikes. Um, so that's, that's definitely a good control of the strike zone. And he's off to a really good start. Four starts, 20 and two-thirds, 31 strikeouts. He's got a whip below one, um, ERA of 1.74. Really, really good start for him. Um, yeah, um, definitely, definitely encouraging, I'd say. For Reds fans who obviously lost Trevor Bauer in the offseason, Luis Castillo has looked very interesting um, to start the season. I'm pretty sure Sonny Gray is not the most healthy at the moment. So any any help you can get from the starting rotation is good help. And he's been solid. Um, and I will say Jeff Hoffman, um, who has not been the best either, but Jeff Hoffman has definitely um, improved his game a lot from when he was in Colorado. Of course, any pitcher who gets the heck out of Colorado is finds a way to improve their game. That's just kind of automatic. Um, but, yeah, Tyler Malley has been really, really good. And I don't know if his start is sustainable, but at least the way he's pitching now, it sure as heck looks like it. So um, I'd definitely be <clears throat> excited about him. Um, the hitter I want to highlight, Mitch Hanniger has been – ridiculous he's probably the hottest hitter in the american league right now um over this past week he's got two home runs he's driven an eight nine hits um you know he's been slugging 667 that's really really good and on the season he's got 17 ribbies five home runs um he's got a 955 ops and he had a big hit last night against the red sox as well um he's part of the reason why the mariners have been have been so good this season is just because he's been so consistent at the plate ever since the start of the year. So, um, and you know, it's funny because I mean, prior to this year, it felt like the Mariners were shelling out um, virtually their entire team, like almost every trade deadline, like their team just looked completely different. It felt like every single season, Mitch Handerger has kind of been a constant over the past, I think five years now, four or five years, um, or at least it's felt like that. Um, He's sort of been like the the veteran, if you will. You know, he's he's one of the more longer tenured guys, um, next to Kyle Seeger, I think, um, in that lineup. But yeah, I really like the way he started out. Another guy I want to talk about, another hitter. I'm just going to do a little bonus here. Um, Jazz Chisholm, who, um, if you don't know about Jazz Chisholm, he was traded from the Diamondbacks to um, the Marlins in the Zach Gallon trade. And you can say all you want about if you're a Marlins fan, you can say all you want about they won the trade until you watch Zach Gallon pitch. Um, but Jazz Chisholm, I will say, has been very, very exciting. Um, definitely, definitely going to be an athlete and a really, really strong top of the order bat for them as, as uh, in the in the coming years. Um, guy can steal bases. He can hit for power. He's a pretty exceptional defender. Um, just wait for this guy to get um, more seasoned and older, and I think you'll start to see him become sort of one of the younger superstars in today's game. But so far this season, he's hitting 320 with an OPS over 1,000, um, 16 hits and 50 at-bats. He's got three homers, four stolen bases as well. Really, really nice start for him. Um, definitely something to be excited about, a player to definitely be excited about for the future. And um, he's definitely been in some highlights recently as well. So, that's the other thing. Plus, he's got the craziest hair in in the game. So, 
um, good on him for um, really embracing the, the personality aspect. So um, those are my two two hitters, actually, um, in pitcher. Yeah, the, the Chisholm um, Gallon trade is a fair trade. It's a fair trade. And that's what you like. You don't want to see anyone get fleeced like the White Sox when they traded for James Shields uh, and they gave up Fernando Tatis Jr. Like that, you just don't want to see that unless you're the team that you know, fleeces them. But as a baseball fan, it's really cool to see that. And Chisholm has been one of the big reasons why the Marlins haven't stunk this year. Now, is he going to continue to hit over 300? No, because that's just not who he was in the minors. He was a low average, high OBP, high power, high speed, and great fielder. And he's done all that except uh, he's been a good average hitter. And I don't expect that to continue, at least for long. But uh, I was also going to shout out Mitch Haniger. So a uh, quick little detour. And I ended up at Vlad Guerrero Jr. Uh, this is a guy that a lot of people tabbed as a breakout hitter. I did as well. And uh, I thought about picking him for MVP, but uh, I just couldn't get over my love for Aaron Judge. He's been off to an okay start. Uh, above average, but certainly not the top five player in baseball start. Maybe like top 20. Uh, but uh, at 383 batting average, 513 OBP, and a 1163 OPS for Vlad Guerrero Jr. right now. He is certainly tearing the ball apart. He's launching the ball a little more. He's up to four, he's up to four home runs. Uh, he had hit the ball hard his first two seasons in the majors. He just wasn't getting that launch angle. But many predicted that when he when he slimmed down this offseason, that uh, it was going to create more torque and he was going to be able to get under the ball a little bit more. And that's what's happened this year. He's off to an insane start, and he's a big reason of why the Blue Jays are afloat, uh, despite the fact that they don't even have George Springer yet. And uh, once he comes back, that offense is going to have a whole new dynamic of an on-base power bat at the top. And then my pitcher, uh, I'm actually going to go with a reliever, and I've been super impressed with him so far. He was in a very high-profile trade leading into, last, uh, leading into last season. And it's Emmanuel Classe of the Cleveland Indians. And uh, this dude is a pitching ninja lord. Uh, because he throws his 100 to 100 mile an hour cutters. Uh, Ryan, I know you guys were able to beat the Indians, but uh, you should be thankful you didn't have to see this guy more because he's nasty. And in seven and one thirds innings, Royal saw, ten- Royal saw him and lost. Right. Because they split, they split with him and he shut him down. He right. Because he, he, he's, he's really nasty. Because right. he was gas. My 90s fastball. That yeah. dude is insane. And uh, he currently has zero ERA. And I remember everyone's like, dude, the Indians got fleeced in this trade. And I'm like, okay, Corey Kluber pitched like 50 innings last year. And uh, he's clearly not healthy. Otherwise, the Indians wouldn't trade for uh, for one relief pitcher. And uh, then Corey Kluber, of course, only ended up pitching one inning and then became a free agent. And now, now you're looking at what Class A is doing. And you're like, the Indians won the trade. It's like, yeah, no kidding. Uh He's nasty. I love watching him pitch. And uh, he's going to be the closer for the Indians for the foreseeable future. And they still have James Karen Jack in that bullpen. Those are two, like, electric right-handed arms. So uh, those are the two guys that I wanted to shout out. So that's going to wrap up this episode of the Golden Sobrero Show. This is our final show. As uh, sophomores at Arizona State, we will com- continue to come live uh, to you guys on YouTube over the summer. So make sure to subscribe to Ryan's YouTube uh, and of course, follow us all on Twitter at DM Stern at CB uh, Cole. What's your Twitter handle? I know it was CB Baseball, but I know it's not anymore. Uh, yeah, I uh, hang on a sec. It's... Well, Ryan's at RM Blank Four. I don't even know my own Twitter handle. That's sad. Um, I'll find it. I got uh, it. Cole see. Cole Bradley zero one Bradley zero one. There it is. And then RM Blank Four uh, to watch us talk about baseball. I mean, we do it all the time. So on Twitter. And then of course we'll, there you go, Ryan at a babe. Uh, there's our Twitter handles. Uh, we thank you all for tuning in through our sophomore year. And uh, we can't wait to come back and be live in the blaze radio studios. Uh, our junior year, or hopefully we'll be live. Who knows with that, uh, with it, but uh, regardless, we'll be live regardless. Yes. Uh, we look forward to bringing you all more baseball content. So thank you for tuning in. Have a good rest of your Friday or hopefully you have a good night's sleep on this Monday.